Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and I wish I could say there was something special planned for my 50th case, but things kind of ran away from me and this is the best I could do. What more do you want from me? Sorry. Anyway, I'm starting to think that Hans Christian Andersen's stories aren't particularly well-suited for feature-length projects. I mean, sure, Disney did all right with The Little Mermaid and The Snow Queen, but that was only after heavy reworking of the material. The Princess and the Pea, uh, the less said of that, the better. And now we have our next offender, another entry in the desperate attempt to ride the coattails of the Disney Renaissance category, Thumbelina. It's a bit ironic that Don Bluth, who left Disney during the studio's Dark Age to blaze new trails of animation, should end up copying their playbook so relentlessly with Thumbelina. And make no mistake, this movie is mostly his doing. He not only co-directed and co-produced, but wrote the script himself after the previous screenwriter was fired. Between that, MGM dropping out of the film due to concerns of Bluth's studio facing bankruptcy, a poor box office reception, and being the first animated film to win a Razzie, more on that later, Thumbelina in many ways feels like a harbinger of things to come. <sighs> but those are horrors, perhaps, for another day. For now, let's examine the case of Thumbelina. Credit where it's due, the opening animation is rather lovely, with nice backgrounds and a flyover of Paris that makes me want to break out into Bells of Notre Dame. And, yep, it's pretty much all downhill from here. This is Giacomo, a swallow who dresses like a Commedia dell'arte character for some reason, and sounds like a knockoff of Lumiere, who himself is a knockoff of Maurice Chevalier. So already this movie has a faded copy of a copy quality to it. This is just part of the reason why Giacomo is sin number one. There are a lot of candidates for most annoying character in this film, but since he's a character that we're supposed to like, he gets the prize. His attempts to help the title character drive home how truly useless he is. I am slipping! Hey, don't let go! Can you swim? No, I can't swim! I can't even move! As the story progresses, his relentless attempts at optimism and assistance in defiance of any input from anyone else go from irritating to downright thoughtless. I will fight him! Shukamon, no, Remember, don't! Shukamon, no, don't! Stop! Stop it, Shukamon! Your heart! Giacomo provides the opening narration. Once upon a time, a poor widow or spinster or something decided she really, really wanted to have a child, but because this is a fairy tale, she can't just swing by the local orphanage, so she asks the local magic-type person to help her out. Local magic-type person gives her a barley corn, which grows into a flower, from which emerges a tiny girl fully grown and also fully clothed through the magic of the G rating. Hello, Mother. I will call you Thumbelina. Oh, nice one, lady. How would you like it if people went around calling you Desperate Lonely Spinsterella or something? Thumbelina tries to do her daily work on the farm while avoiding the literally thousands of ways she could die horribly, while the barnyard animals sing sin number two, Thumbelina. Thumbelina! really, really love to know what was going through Barry Manilow's mind when he wrote this song. Sure, we'll have a bunch of chickens squawk the heroine's name like they're getting a rectal probe. It'll be great! Even Jodie Benson, the voice of Ariel herself, sounds shrill and unpleasant during this number. As for the rest of the lyrics... Thumbelina! First she's mending, then baking, pretending she's making things up. So she's pretending she's pretending? Dude, that's almost like zen or something. After a long day of getting screamed at by livestock, Thumbelina gets a bedtime story from her mother while angsting about how itty bitty she is. Once upon a time. Oh, mother, please. Are there any stories about, about little people? Come on, Mom, read me Warwick Davis's biography. Mother comforts her by showing her pictures of fairies, which Thumbelina pours over while singing a remarkably vague I Want song. 
As luck would have it, a troop of actual fairies happens to be passing nearby doing some kind of Fantasia nature sprite deal. Covert, my love, it is the autumn today, and we've begun the golding of the leaves. Thank you, Queen Exposition. The Crown Prince, Cornelius, decides to skip out of leaf golding, overhears Thumbelina singing, and decides to investigate. <laughs> May I cut in? Oh, no, wait, wait. Come back. Oh, I, I apologize. I didn't mean to frighten you. Wait a minute. He sparkles. He breaks into her room and watches her in a creepy See? manner. No more sword. Oh, sweet Lucifer, we're in Twilight. But this being a movie, Thumbelina is immediately taken with what, as far as we know, is not only the first person of her own size, but the first humanoid male of any size she's ever met, and she's willing to hitch a ride with him. Why, he... he's amazing! What, you've never seen a bee before? Seriously, I know she's supposed to be sheltered and all, but this woman would be impressed with pocket lint. While Thumbelina and Cornelius go off on their magic car, uh, bee ride and sing Let Me Be Your Wings, let us examine sin number three, the so-called love story. Now, in the original story, Thumbelina's love interest was literally introduced six paragraphs from the end, so yeah, you want to bring him in a little earlier here. But it's not enough to introduce the relationship in the first act instead of the third. You have to make it stand out and make us root for it. Throughout this sequence, Cornelius comes off as smarmy and Thumbelina as dopey. Sure, the song is distinctly better than the rest of the score, and the animation is nice, but the Disney movies of the time not only had good music and animation, but characters we were invested in. This one doesn't. Cornelius is all set to propose to Thumbelina after one song, but he has to talk to his parents first, so with an, oh yeah, I'm also the fairy prince, see you tomorrow, bye, he goes off to be useless for the majority of the movie. Unfortunately for our lovebirds, a Piero Toad and his spicy Latina mother, who has the most disturbing animated chest I've seen since Disco Worms, overheard their song and were taken by Thumbelina's voice, so Mama Toad disguises herself as the Taliban and spirits Thumbelina away to their riverboat, where she tries to persuade the little Chanteuse to join their cabaret. Uh, my mother will be very worried. Oh. <laughs> Mama no worry. Mama proud. When you are a star, she make big fiesta and invite all the neighbors to come and see her little niña, who have become big, 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 very big. Big? Oh, you mean big? You're not the sparkliest fairy in the meadow, are you, Thumbs? Thumbelina tells Mama Toad all about her intentions to marry Cornelius, but Mama Toad gives her the old, you can have a career or a family, but not both routine. Things and windows falling with the diapers changing, with the roof chips leaking, and the enchilada spoiling. Oh. Do you know how to do these things? Like you will have to do these things, or does the very thought of it make you win? Uh. I thought so. Then, don't marry the prince. I don't know, if you don't want to do housework, marrying into royalty sounds like the smart thing to do. But that whole idea gets thrown out the window when Mama Toad decides to marry Thumbelina off to Grundel, her Cirque du Soleil reject son who was drooling over Thumbelina earlier, and strands her on a lily pad while the Toad family goes off to get an officiant. Luckily for Thumbelina, but unluckily for us, Giacomo comes along and, despite being completely useless, manages to get Thumbelina into a situation where other animals can be slightly more useful. Who are you? Thumbelina? These are the jitterbugs. The jitterbugs? The jitterbugs? Man, first they get cut from the Wizard of Oz and then they wind up here. They can't catch a break. And now, sin number four, how little Thumbelina figures in her own story. I think this is why Hans Christian Andersen doesn't translate to film very well. 
he doesn't tend to write very active protagonists. Whether it's Thumbelina or the Ugly Duckling or the Steadfast Tin Soldier, his characters spend the story having things happen to them rather than making anything happen. It doesn't make for an interesting central character, and Thumbelina's constant whining over her predicament only makes things worse. Oh, you are all very brave. Oh, thank you, but I'm afraid I'll never see my home again. I'm cold, I'm lost, and I'm hungry. There's no place in this big world for little people. Another thing. Let's assume for the moment that Giacomo isn't capable of flying with Thumbelina on his back, even though that's demonstrably false. Why can't he just fly back to Thumbelina's house and get her mother to help her? These are small animals. It's not like she could have gone very far as the crow or irritating swallow flies. Instead, he goes off on this fool's errand to find Cornelius, even though he has no clue where to start. Speaking of fool's errands, Cornelius is trying to enlist his parents' help on his. Look, father, please delay the winter frost as long as you can. I need time to find Thumbelina. Cornelius! Corbett, my love, we can't delay the frost for more than a day. Didn't you just have the first day of fall literally yesterday? And you thought Westeros had fucked up weather patterns. Thumbelina continues on her quest to go home, literally walking right past her house, because, you know, it's not like any of her traveling companions can fly above the tall grass and help her get her bearings, when... <laughs> yeah, that's a normal reaction to being accosted by a Gilbert Gottfried character. Yago aside, has he ever done anything that was remotely tolerable? Mr. Beetle, good job on the naming there, sexually assaults Thumbelina. Is every non-ambiguously gay male character in this film going to come on to her? Sweet Lucifer, Jane Austen wasn't this obsessed with her heroine's romantic entanglements. And whisks her away to sing at the Beetle Ball, or rather have her stand there dressed like a cross between Queen Elizabeth I and Gary Oldman's Dracula, while we get this. If you're blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go anywhere but this? This movie's The Pits. Baby, it's the Beetle Ball, and bugs are crawling to get in. When they hear that beetle, beetle, oh. beetle, Rule number one, never have Gilbert Gottfried sing. Never even have a voice double sing for a Gilbert Gottfried character, which is what's happening here, because no matter what, you're going to end up with someone who sounds like Gilbert Gottfried singing, and nobody wants to hear that ever. Thumbelina's costume comes off, and the insects, at least I think they're insects, they mostly look like what Ralph Bakshi would see after getting a tab of the bad acid, decide she doesn't conform to their standards of beauty and send her spiraling into another self-pity crisis. Beetle says I'm ugly. Does Prince Cornelius think you are ugly? No. He thinks I'm beautiful. Mm. And so you are, mon ami. You see, Thumbelina, you shouldn't care what that one guy thinks of you. Care what that other guy thinks of you instead. After providing a token amount of comfort to Thumbelina, Giacomo continues his quest to find the Vale of the Fairies, which mostly involves asking random animals who are too preoccupied with surviving to give him directions. As a result, he promptly gets a thorn through his wing and is helpless when the weather starts turning. Let it go! Let it go! Can't hold it back anymore! I don't care if you're sick of it, it still beats anything in this movie. Speaking of useless characters, which is a phrase that could apply to the entire plot, Cornelius is also too stupid to come in from the cold and gets frozen in a pond as a result. Meanwhile, two of the more irritating characters in the film decide to join forces. Why don't you just nab this prince and you set up a trap for the girl, using him as the bait? You know, get her to come to you. Nab the prince. And set up a trap. Nab the prince. Yes, nab the prince and set up a trap. Yes. It's bad enough this movie doesn't have an effective protagonist. It doesn't have any effective antagonists either. 
I think Grendel is supposed to be the main villain, given that he's the one Cornelius tangles with in the climax, but he's too dumb and ineffectual to be a threat. He doesn't do much. He doesn't even say much. About half of his dialogue is some variation on how he loves Thumbelina and wants to marry her. Mom, I love her. What? I love Thumbelina. I marry her. I marry her. Mr. Beetle has slightly more bearing on the plot, but is mostly just annoying comic relief. These two aren't menacing, they're certainly not funny, and they never actually pose any legitimate obstacles for the main characters. They're more incidental complications than villains. There are a couple characters later on who could have fit the bill, but they join the party too late to make much of an impression, and the one they do make, uh, we're coming to that. Beetle finds Cornelius and hauls him, ice block and all, back to Grundle. One ice cold prince coming up. Where do you want him? There. He looks dead. Dead? Dead smash! What difference does it make? You killed him. He's not pining, he's passed on! This prince is no more! He has ceased to be! If you hadn't entombed him in an ice cube, he'd be pushing up the daisies! This is an ex-prince! The two of them just straight up ditch Cornelius and go to plan B, while the jitterbugs, remember them, hang around to thaw the prince out. And hey, remember Thumbelina's adoptive mother? She's still in the movie too. I know you have Broadway legend Barbara Cook and you want her to sing, but this scene just screams we're padding the movie to feature length. And speaking of Broadway legends, guess who's fetched Thumbelina in from the storm? Where... where am I? In my kitchen. I'm Miss Fieldmouse and we are snug and safe underground. What is it with the character names in this? Imagine if people were like that. Hi, I'm Mr. Human, this is my wife Mrs. Human, and our kids boy and girl human. Mrs. Fieldmouse is sin number seven, and one of those characters I'd mentioned earlier who might have been a good antagonist if she were introduced earlier and had some actual bearing on the story. As it is, she's mostly just thoughtless and nasty. You were engaged to the fairy prince, um, Cornelius, I believe? Well, almost. Oh, that is so sad. What? That he was found stone cold frozen dead in the snow. Oh, Thumbelina, forgive me. Sometimes I just blurt things out without thinking. You're still young, though. There'll be another. Put this on. We'll take these corn cakes to Mr. Mole. He lives just down the tunnel. I'd rather not. Oh, I saved your life this very day, and you'd rather not? Antichrist, this woman could give Mother Gothel lessons in passive aggression. Worse yet is the part where Mr. Mole, everybody say it with me now, decides he wants to marry Thumbelina and enlists Mrs. Fieldmouse as matchmaker because, hey, who better for the job than the original Dolly Levi, resulting in the most annoying song in the movie. And remember, this is the movie that contains this. Thumbelina! Yes, it's time for sin number eight, Marry the Mole. Cause love won't pay the mortgage or put porridge in your bowl. Dearie, marry the mole. Remember that Razzie award I mentioned? It was for this song, and you can tell why. Romeo and Juliet were very much in love when they were wed. They honored every vow. So where are they now? They're dead. Dead. Very, very dead. Barry Manilow actually got paid to write those lyrics. Also, at the risk of being forced to turn in my musical geek card, I have to say that I have never liked Carol Channing's voice. She sounds like a chain-smoking grandmother who forgot to put in her dentures. Mr. Mole, by the way, is another arrives-too-late-to-be-a-good-villain character, even though the evidence suggests that he is a straight-up serial killer. You know what that guy does to beetles? Do you have any idea what he does? He stops them. 
He stuffed so many pins up on his walls! Also in the mole's chamber of horrors is the apparently dead Giacomo, who of course isn't really dead because we're not that lucky. Thumbelina nurses him back to health, and he promptly goes off to be useless again, leaving her to face her dreaded... <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. I mean, look at her. It's like Queen Amidala had Lady Gaga design her confirmation gown. But Thumbelina has a vision of Cornelius singing of a priest to her, giving her the strength to commit her one act of agency in the entire movie. I cannot marry Mr. Mole. I don't love him. Thumbelina ditches the mole at the altar while the newly thawed Cornelius does battle with Grundle, plummeting to yet another presumed but not really death. Meanwhile, Giacomo shows back up, and apparently his randomly ask for directions technique has paid off, because he now flies Thumbelina to the Vale of the Fairies without bothering to listen to what she has to say, because why start now? Giacomo, this is silly. This is a weed patch. This is the Vale of the Fairies. But of course, Thumbelina's singing causes flowers to bloom and brings Cornelia sailing back into her life. Will you marry me? I will. <sighs> wings. I have wings. How does this even work? Do fairy girls get their wings when they go into heat? No matter, Thumbelina has her wish for, I don't know, love or acceptance or whatever, and it's time for the royal wedding. And now, a hymn in honor of the bride. Thumbelina! It's a pity that Don Bluth should be such a talented animator, yet be so hit and miss in his output. Parts of Thumbelina are lovely to look at and even show a hint of promise, but the meandering plot, useless characters, and grating songs squish what tiny hope there is. It may not be the worst of the Disney knockoffs, but that doesn't make it any good. As for punishments, I get the feeling everybody's already got what's coming to them. Barry Manilow had to listen to a cavalcade of awful voices bring life to his awful songs. Mrs. Fieldmouse probably married Mr. Mole and wound up pinned to his wall of death. And Thumbelina and Cornelius wouldn't have gotten 50 feet before he got lost in a swamp and she was engaged to a muskrat or something. It couldn't have happened to a nicer group of people. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs>